My name is Takahiro Ohara, and I'm an MD-PhD student at Washington University in St. Louis. When I was a medical student a few years ago, this is me as a newly minted student, and me with my classmates at a local health fair, I had the opportunity to talk to and learn from many different patients. And one patient in particular made a big impact on me. This patient was a 64-year-old male who came into the hospital with stomach pain, diarrhea, weight loss, and fatigue. And when I talked to this patient, I remember he was visibly distressed. He told me that he was tired all the time and that he had trouble getting out of bed every morning. And no matter how much he ate, he felt like he was literally starving to death. We suspected that there might be something going on in his intestinal tract. And so we decided to do a biopsy where we took a small piece of tissue from his gut and looked at it under the microscope. Normally, the intestine is lined by millions of these finger-like structures called villi. These villi are extremely important for nutrient absorption. But in this patient, his villi were completely destroyed. And so we decided to give this patient the current standard of care, which is a dietary intervention. And so removing any food that may be causing the damage. However, Many months later, this patient came into the hospital again, and he looked even worse. He appeared even more lethargic and emaciated, and his villi were still damaged. And I remember just feeling helpless because there weren't any medication, any lifestyle modification that we could provide to help this patient. After witnessing firsthand the importance of having healthy villi for our well-being, I was really motivated to find new ways to treat these patients. This patient had what's called persistent villus atrophy, where his villi appeared continuously damaged even with treatment. Unfortunately, this is not uncommon. Over one third of patients with damaged villi can experience this. Currently, many treatment efforts are focused on removing the agent that's causing the damage. However, this doesn't always work. In fact, there's not a lot known about how villi restore normally after injury. And so I wondered, by understanding how villi normally heal, can we develop new therapeutics around promoting this process? And so during graduate school, I decided to study this question. That is, what molecular and cellular processes drive villus recovery after injury? So here's what the villus looks like at the cellular level using a standard dye. Notice the finger-like structures that project into the lumen of the intestine. In the image on the right, each villus is predominantly lined by a cell type known as enterocytes. Enterocytes are specialized epithelial cells that mediate nutrient uptake and metabolism. Now, studying villus injury and repair in humans is quite challenging. I can't really ask healthy people to let me damage their villi and perform multiple biopsies on them. So instead, I turned to an animal model that is commonly used in the laboratory, the mouse. Mice are great models because one, their intestine looks just like humans with villi, and two, it is quite easy to change their genetics. Now, going back to our patient, we ultimately didn't know what exactly was causing the damage in his gut lining, but the most likely culprits were some sort of inflammation, so an overactive immune system, or an infection, for instance, due to a virus. We can model inflammation and a viral infection in mice using a double-stranded RNA analog called PolyIC. So think of PolyIC as a viral mimic. When PolyIC is given to mice, there is rapid induction of cell death within just a few hours of injection in the villus compartment as shown by the brown staining. This causes the villi to collapse, similar to what we observed in our patient. The power of this model is that once the villi gets damaged, these structures can repair and regenerate in a reproducible fashion. And so this offered me the unique opportunity to study how villi repair after injury, and potentially understand how this process can go awry in disease. Using this model, I first asked the question, what happens to the enterocytes? These are the main cells that line the villi, 
and they play a crucial role in nutrient absorption. What I found was that during villus atrophy at the 24-hour time point, the enterocytes were essentially lost. As you can see, there's no more red cells that's covering the damaged villi. But during regeneration, the enterocytes came back, and one week after injury, the villi returned to normal. And so there was something really interesting going on transiently during the atrophy phase. And so I decided to focus on this time point. Now, if you look very closely, there are still cells lining the rudimentary villi, as pointed out by the black triangles. But these cells are really small. And so because these cells look nothing like any cell that you see in the normal gut, I decided to call these cells atrophy-induced villus epithelial cells, or AVEX. Here's a high-powered view of these cells using electron microscopy. On the top are normal enterocytes, and here we're only seeing part of the cell because enterocytes are quite tall. On the surface of enterocytes are these hair-like extensions called microvilli, which gives enterocytes their absorptive function. On the bottom are the AVEX, and here we can see the entirety of the cell because, again, these cells are quite small, and also they have poorly developed microvilli, and they contain a lot of lipid droplets which are the circles that you see within the cell. This is typically a sign of malabsorption. Recall from our patient that he had trouble taking up nutrients and that he kept on losing weight. And part of the reason is that his villi were not functioning well. By microscopy, we can see that these AVEX, which line damaged villi, look unhealthy. They look like immature versions of enterocytes. And so to further characterize these cells and understand how they're different from normal enterocytes, I performed a microarray analysis. A microarray is essentially a small chip that allows you to compare the gene expression profile between two different samples or cell types. Each circle in the chip represents a single gene. And if there's more of a gene in one sample based on RNA levels, then the circle gives a color. Red, if there's more in the red sample, blue if there's more in the blue sample. And so using this method, I can determine the expression of practically all of the genes within the cell type or sample of my interest. Now the intestine is composed of multiple different cell types, including epithelial cells, immune cells, and stromal cells. And to specifically compare the gene expression between enterocytes versus AVEX, I first use laser to isolate or capture these cells under the microscope to get a purified population. This is called laser capture microdissection. Once I got my purified sample of enterocytes and purified samples of AVEX, I submitted them for microarray analysis. This is a pretty standard volcano plot that you get from analyzing microarray data, where each dot represents a single gene. The x-axis here is the full change, which is how big the difference is. And the y-axis is a p-value, which is how meaningful that difference is. And the genes that are significantly different are colored here. And as you can see, there's a lot of genes there. And so I decided to focus on the top most differentially expressed genes in AVEX. So these are the genes that are on the top right corner of the plot within the dashed box. So here's a heat map showing you some of those top most differentially expressed genes. Each column here represents a sample, and each row represents a specific gene as indicated. And what I found was that genes that are expressed in the fetal intestine, so that includes mesothelin, clusterin, IL-1 RN, etc., were all highly upregulated in AVEX compared to enterocytes. Furthermore, when I took all of the genes that are expressed in the fetal intestine and, and then asked whether that fetal signature is more enriched in AVEX or in pterocytes, this is called the gene set enrichment analysis. In the graph on the right, each black line represents a single fetal gene, and the green curve represents the degree of enrichment. And as you can see, majority of the fetal genes were more expressed in AVEX compared to enterocytes. And thereby, the enrichment score was much higher in AVEX, and the green curve skewed towards that direction. 
This demonstrated that a fetal or developmental program gets churned on after injury within these cells. And so this is really interesting, but whenever you do a gene expression analysis, such as a microarray, you want to try to validate your results using another technique. Here I perform the technique called in situ hybridization, which allows me to take a gene of interest, in this case clusterin, which is one of the fetal markers, and look at the expression of its RNA within the tissue. As you can see in normal villi, clusterin was not expressed. But in, during villus atrophy, clusterin was highly expressed in AVEX, as, as you can see by the red staining. And so I saw a similar pattern of expression with the other fetal markers as well using this technique. And so what is driving this fetal program that appears to be a defining feature of AVEX? Could it be some kind of developmental pathway that's involved? One pathway that caught my attention was the HIPPO signaling pathway. It's called a HIPPO pathway because back in 2003, scientists discovered a mutant fly that had abnormally large organs. They named the gene that was mutated in these flies HIPPO because the flies resemble the hippopotamus. It turns out the HIPPO pathway is very important in controlling organ size during development. But recent research has also suggested that this pathway is crucial for tissue regeneration and in disease processes in adult animals. And so this HIPPO pathway was an interesting candidate for potentially controlling the fetal program in my injury model. So briefly, how does the HIPPO pathway work? Well, the main effector of the HIPPO pathway is called YAP, or YES-associated protein. YAP is typically inhibited by the hippo proteins as represented by the hippopotamus. And so generally YAP is inhibited. However, when YAP is relieved from the inhibition of the hippo proteins, it moves into the nucleus and activates gene expression. And so the key point here is that when YAP is cytoplasmic, it's inactive, and when YAP is nuclear, it's active. And so if YAP is involved, Looking at the RNA level or looking at my microarray data wouldn't necessarily be helpful. Instead, by looking at the localization of the YAP protein within the cell, I can tell whether or not it's activated. Here's a bar graph showing you the localization of YAP in normal villi versus atrophic villi. Cytoplasmic YAP is represented by a beige color, and nuclear YAP is represented by a dark brown color. And if YAP is both nuclear and cytoplasmic, that's represented by a light brown color. And what I found was that YAP was largely cytoplasmic in normal villi, but during villus atrophy, YAP becomes predominantly nuclear. These are representative images showing you that YAP is in fact nuclear within the AVEX, suggesting that it's activated in these cells. And so to functionally test whether YAP is in fact controlling the fetal program, I looked at mice that were deficient in the YAP gene, which I referred to as YAP knockout mice. As you can see, compared to control mice, the expression of YAP was completely lost in the knockout mice, as you'd expect. Notice that this is without injury, and these mice do pretty fine. The villi are normal, and that's likely because YAP is generally inhibited. And so taking away something that's inactive doesn't necessarily do anything. And so the interesting question is what happens after the injury when the activity of YAP gets turned on. So now we're looking at post-injury during villus atrophy. On the left is control mice, and on the right is YAP knockout mice. And like I've shown you before, in control mice, the damaged villi are lined with AVEX that express fetal markers. In this case, I'm showing you clusterin expression again. In the YAP knockout mice, the expression of clusterin and many of the other fetal markers that I'm not showing you here were gone. And so now we have a scenario, scenario where we have normal AVEX in control mice with the fetal program and abnormal AVEX in YAP knockout mice stripped of the fetal program. And so what is the consequence of having abnormal AVEX? 
Because AVEX are at the surface of the gut and they directly interface with the external environment, I hypothesize that these cells play and serve as a shield or as a barrier against the harmful substances that may be present in the gut lumen from reaching the host. I can assess the intestinal barrier function in mice by orally delivering a green dye and then measuring the serum levels of the dye. How this works is that when the barrier or shield is intact, the dye can, cannot go through and so it gets flushed out. But when there's a breach in the barrier, the dye can seep through and enter the bloodstream. And so by measuring the level of the dye in the blood, I can assess the quality of the intestinal barrier. And so when I performed this experiment, I found that in yap knockout mice, the level of the dye in the serum was much higher compared to control mice. This suggested that AVEX play a critical role in maintaining barrier integrity and that this function was dependent on YAP. And so finally, what happens when your barrier is compromised as a result of AVEX becoming dysfunctional? Well, it turns out to have a big impact. On this graph, we're looking at villus length at various time points during injury repair. Recall that the taller the villi, the more surface area for nutrient absorption, the better it is for the animal. At the 24 hour time point in both control and yap knockout mice, the villi gets damaged and undergo atrophy to a similar degree. But then we start seeing a striking difference during the regenerative phase. Where in control mice represented by the blue line, the villi regenerate robustly. But in yap knockout mice, represented by the dashed red line, villus regeneration is greatly impaired. Here's what the regenerating villi looks like at the 48 hour time point. On the top are control mites, and here the villi are robustly regrowing back to their original length. On the bottom are yap knockout mice. Notice that the villi here are shorter, they look stunted, and then they're also aggregated. This reminded me of the persistent villus atrophy pathology that I saw in our patient. And so together, these results demonstrated that YAP plays an essential role in villus regeneration after injury. As humans, when we sense danger or when we're hurt, we instinctively assume a fetal position to sort of protect ourselves. When the villi in our gut gets damaged, a similar phenomenon occurs at the molecular and cellular level, where after villus injury, a unique cell type called AVEX emerges and covers the damaged villi. A fetal or developmental program gets reinitiated in these cells. And this program is crucial for repair, as well as for protecting the host. As an aspiring physician scientist, my goal is to make discoveries in the lab and translate those findings into the development of better therapeutics. Going back to my patient, where he had a long-standing problem with his gut health, I hope that my finding could open new possibilities for better treatment options for patients like him. As the Nobel Prize winning physicist William Lawrence Bragg once said, the important thing in science is to not only obtain new facts, but also discover new ways of thinking about them. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Thaddeus Stappenbeck, and my co-mentor, Dr. Marco Colonna, for their mentorship. I would also like to thank the cores at Washington University, my thesis committee, my funding sources, and iBiology for giving me this opportunity to share my research.